tribute. Wonderful worship today, amen? Wonderful experiences that we've had with each other and with God. Let's just pray that God continues to be with us as we now turn our attention to to His Word. God in heaven, may everything that is said in here be straight from you, Lord. May it bless, may it uplift, and may everyone here leave here with a deeper sense of hope. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Last Sabbath, um, there was an event that the conference organized to provide some training to local elders, and I had the opportunity to go to that and participate at some level, and I got to share a little bit about writing sermons. Uh, Many of our elders uh, preach in their churches. Some of our elders preach in this church from time to time, and so having uh, lay people like elders who are willing to do that is a great blessing. One of the things I talked about is uh, don't ignore your title. Uh, titles uh, say a lot about uh, what you're going to speak on. I said, don't, don't make them boring. You know, you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but people do. They do. And um, is family a boring title? I mean, we could have come up with something a little bit more provocative, I suppose. Uh, but as I was... Uh, preparing and and getting ready for a new series of uh, things. Uh, They're all going to be oriented towards the topic of family and related topics. Family is a beautiful, beautiful thing, uh, but it's also a messy thing. It's also a messy thing. It's something we all are are driving towards in our life and trying to work towards a, a better system of harmony and respect and relationship and compassion. But as long as the human element is there, um, it's never going to quite be perfect, is it? So I left it, I left it as it is. I didn't come up with anything more dramatic. Um, I want to talk with you about family. And so um, I do have my kids quiz today, so I think that's next. I'm going to talk a little bit about family and, and things related to that. Can we do a black and yellow? And if we can have a couple of volunteers, I see Nassim coming up here. I'd like to get these into the mic. Can we get one more volunteer? Are you going to do both? All right, long arm. No, okay. (laughs) Jaden, thank you so much. Uh, On the topic of fam... Whoops. Number one, what are the names of the first four people on earth? Do we know that? I saw Anna's hand go up right there in the back. I know, Julian, you're raring to go here. Ladies first, maybe. We'll try that. Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. You got it. Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. Well done. When you see these names, do you think happy family? You know, they play a very important role, and obviously there's all kinds of dynamics, but the Bible begins. God's initial message and how it's constructed in the Bible begins, of course, with perfection in Eden, but very quickly the introduction of the family and the fall and everything that happens from there, we see the challenges that come with the family. And that's, that's interesting. Okay, kind of a, another one. What are the first words of the Lord's Prayer? Any of you memorize your Lord's Prayer when Jesus teaches us how to pray? What are the first words of the Lord's Prayer? Any young people? I see A.B. A.B.'s hand here. And Jacobin, I see you over there. Let's see if A.B has it for us. Our Father. Uh, you had to, yeah, you thought it was a trick one, didn't you? It is Our Father. You know, it, and I know you've probably heard sermons or maybe you thought about this before. It is quite profound that in the Lord's instruction of how we are to speak to our Creator, how we are to speak to that immortal, invisible God begins with the words, not our Almighty, or not El Shaddai, or not, you know, some of these other grand titles, or even, you know, the Sovereign, or even our Lord. Jesus says when you want to talk to your Creator, He invites you, He instructs you to say, our Father. It begins. Now, all those other attributes are wonderful. He is immortal. He's invisible. He is sovereign. He's all these other things. 
But in our initial and primary relationship with God, he says, I, I am a father and you are my children. Number three, what is the fifth commandment? How many of you know your, your Ten Commandments? Julian was there. I know he had it. He was working on it. All right. We have back here, though. Maybe we'll get the help we need back here. The fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. You see where we're going here, don't you? You got it. That's right. Honor your father. I know. I see it over there, Dylan. Honor your father and mother. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, now, every one of the Ten Commandments is, is profound and important, and we can dice it into different pieces to digest it differently. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we love the, the centrality of the Sabbath commandment and the prophetic uh, you know, reality of what the Sabbath means. We put it into our name as Seventh-day Adventists. And that doesn't mean we diminish the other nine commands. We just see that there's a, a vital element that is lost that we're trying to reestablish in the last days. But in relationship to the Ten Commandments, the fourth and fifth command kind of create a bridge to the others because the way we keep the Sabbath is we honor our Father, right? That's what we do. We honor our Father. And as human beings on earth, God instructs us to honor our mother and our Father as one of our primary central uh, realities of what it means to be a human being and to be a believer in our Father as He commands us to honor our Father and mother. All right, this is actually the last one, guys. Who was told, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed? Who said, who was this speaking of? In you, all right, Jacobet is over here. I know, A.B., you are just really raring to go. Um, I, I don't know, it reminds me. Oh, you, I think, I think it, it got to you. Okay, over here. Uh, which, which one? Right here, right here. I see a couple hands over here. So, Nassim, help us out here. Abraham. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Bailey. All right, guys, I just had a few. Thank you, Jaden. Thank you, Nassim. Appreciate your help. And uh, by the way, I'm going to call his name interchangeable. I know it starts out as Abram, and then it becomes Abraham. Uh, forgive me. I'm just going to call him Abraham. Uh, for the most part, um, as we think of this. Now, I want you to think of this passage um, that many of us have heard many times. God tells Abraham, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, there's a lot of meaning in that. It means the nations. It means the different people groups. Uh, as, is as a family, as a tribe, as a language, okay? It, it can have the, the implication of the individual as well, but the language that God gives us here is the language of the family. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Throughout salvation history, God has illustrated that the way in which He wants to manufacture salvation to us is that something in heaven has been broken, okay? Sin created a problem. It broke something. So throughout salvation history, God instructs his believers to build. Okay, Noah built an ark. Moses built a tabernacle in the desert. Solomon would build the temple. David would build a nation. All of these things were to be instruments and agents and vehicles of salvation. The ark was for salvation. The tabernacle was for salvation. The state of Israel, the nation of Israel, was to be an ambassadors to the world for salvation. Okay? And all of those are now gone. Now, the meaning, the eternal symbolism of them remains. But they have fundamentally changed. We are not building a boat made out of wood so that we can climb in it together. The meaning of that, of what it represents is still there, but the boat is gone. The tabernacle in the desert was never meant to be eternal. It was, you know, a, a symbol of something to be later on developed into the, the temple. But the temple and the nation of Israel were to last forever. The nation of Israel and the temple were designed by God. If the people had been faithful in their part of the covenant, they were to be a nation that would last forever. But they are not. They broke the covenant. The temple was destroyed. The meaning of those things still exists today, but they have fundamentally changed. Fundamentally changed. We are children of Israel if we believe in Jesus Christ, right? But it's now something more of an aspect of faith. 
than a geopolitical nation state. Even when we come into the New Testament, and I want to be very careful here. I've prayed a lot about the next words I'm going to say, okay? So I need you to hear me. In the New Testament, Jesus builds a church. And we as New Testament believers have every confidence that the church is going to last forever, isn't it? Is the church going to... Now you're all like, wait, wait a minute. Where is he going? I can't. Is the church going to last forever? Yes, the church is going to last forever, Jesus says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell are not going to uh, overcome it. In the, new, in the book of Revelation, God writes the letters to the seven churches. Let him who has an ear hear what the Lord says to the churches in the last days. However, it would be historically ignorant and biblically arrogant for us not to believe that even the church might look fundamentally different when we get to the very end, to the very last days, than what it looks like today. Israel looks fundamentally different. The ark still exists. The ark, we're in the ark. We're in the church. This is the ark. But it looks fundamentally different. Are, are you with me? Am I going too fast? Sula, you and me, are we all right? Okay. So even the church, friends, even the church, which will exist in its eternal meaning, in its symbolism, it will last. But it might look very different than it looks right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? But there is one thing that God has built. There is one thing that God has given us. There is one symbol, an illustration that will not change even till the end of time when Jesus Christ comes. There is one more agency, one more vehicle that God has given his people that will not fundamentally change because it is the exact thing that God is developing for us in heaven and he wants us to experience on earth. Have you figured out what it is? It's the family. The family. The family, for all of its flaws, for all of its challenges, the family is what will not ever be demonstrably different from the ideal that God wants us to experience. He tells Abraham, don't build a tabernacle. Don't build. He builds altars and all things like that, all right? He doesn't build a boat. What Abraham builds is a family. A family. And while that family has all kinds of problems, just like Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel had all, and we like to look at things like the boat or the temple because they are so perfect. The ark is so perfect. It did such a great job. It survived the flood. The, the ark is perfect. I can wrap my mind around an ark. And the temple was so beautiful. It was one of the wonders of the world. Decorated people from all over the world came to see the wisdom of Solomon and the beauty. And, and we look at it and say, that's perfect. But how many of you have met a perfect family? I don't see anybody jumping up and saying hallelujah. Yo, Gio. Yes, sir, man. The innocence of a child. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Family is a little bit more messy. And so we don't always appreciate the depth and value and the gift of what the family was intended to mean for us. So how does God feel about family? It's the primary way in which he uh, relates to us. Now, again, just to illustrate how we get to Abraham, the Bible begins in perfection. Eden is glorious. There's no sin. You know, the rebellion had started. We know that because the devil is there. But, the, heaven, you know, Eden is perfect. You know, all the animals, everything is good. But after the fall, you see this steep decline of the human race. And uh, you see this, this time after time after time. Failure and challenges, you have the fall. And this is just a few. We could list additional things. The humiliation of Noah, the murder of Lamech, other elements that the Bible seems to say, look, after the fall, things were rough on earth. We go from bad thing after bad thing after bad thing. Even the flood didn't totally eliminate it because right after the flood, the people that, uh, the nations that kind of develop from the family of Noah, they start building a tower to defy God. You're not going to ever do that again. We can overcome you. We can build a tower and you're going to have no power over us. 
So even after the flood, the sense of sin and rebellion continued through many of the generations of people until there's a transition in the biblical narrative. Something fundamentally changes in Genesis 12 when we are introduced to an individual by the name of Abram or Abraham. And in this story, God says, I have now introduced a solution that is intended to be understood and appreciated, not just in the Old Testament, not just in in that period of time, but for all time. In Abraham, in his faith, in his relationships, in his marriage, in his children. Now, some of you know the story, and you say, how can that be? This guy's a mess. That's right. And we are still struggling And we see both the good and the bad, and yet it's the faith of Abraham, and it's the faith of what he is able to establish in his family and amongst his generations that is the enduring vehicle of not only our own salvation, but of our ability to present salvation to our fallen world. So we're going to spend some time looking at the family of Abraham. But how does God feel about family? You know some of these verses. As a father has compassion on his children. By the way, a little promo for the chosen there. (laughs) As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord, as a father, has compassion on those who fear him. And look at him as a father. As a father, he says, this is how I relate to you. And not only is the the male element of compassion in the heart of God, so does he understand a mother's love. Can a woman forget her nursing child? And there's some other things in the child of her womb. He says, you all understand the passion of a mother. He says, but even if such a case may exist where they may forget, even if you can conceive of that moment, I will not forget you. God uses this intimacy of family, intimacy of mother, father, to express his love for us. And of, the, of course, the verse we, we know so well, the John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he sent his family. He sent his son, his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The biblical narrative, the biblical story of salvation, while there's so many other elements So many other uh, symbols and things that have great meaning and great power within the family itself is the most powerful illustration of the power of God. And that's why the devil hates it so much. That's why the devil hates it so much and why he attacks us, attacks our family, attacks our children, attacks our marriages. You know this verse from Genesis 12, 3, in you, God says to Abraham, All the families of the earth will be blessed. Did you know that God wants to bless your family? God wants to bless your family. Now, again, for those of us who are familiar with this, I'm going to be spending some time in Abraham over the next few weeks, and you might think, oh, I've heard it all, I've seen it all. Yeah, I'm not claiming that I have a knowledge that you've never experienced before, but I think we're going to bring out some things that maybe you haven't thought of in a while, or maybe you've never thought at all. Oftentimes when we look at this verse... We say what God is meaning is that one day, the great, 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 grandson of Abraham is going to be Jesus, right? Now, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. Please, brothers and sisters, don't walk out of this place and say that Pastor Dave doesn't believe that Jesus is the one who would bless all the families of the earth. This is absolutely a reference that one day the Son of God would come through the lineage of Abraham and his sacrifice would make salvation possible to everybody. But if we limit it to that, if we say that's all it was about, we miss a greater element of what the family of Abraham was also to be as a blessing to all people who would learn from it and study it and apply it to their lives. Yes, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. But if that's all it meant, it could have ended with Genesis 12, 3. By the way, there was this guy named Abraham, and you know he had a rough time having babies, but eventually he did. And wow, Jesus came for that. Don't need to talk about him anymore. And we cannot look at Abraham as solely the donor of seed that would lead to the Messiah. It's much more than that. It's much more than that. God invites us to look at the intermingling of his marriage, his children, how he would relate to his community, 
and that we would see the fulfillment of Christ even in his own day. Even in his own day, Abraham would be able to produce the image and glory of God to his community even long before Christ would come. The, the basic dynamics of this are fairly simple. We understand and we promote and we encourage everyone should have a strong walk with God, an individual, a private, a personal, you know, be able to call God our Father, our Father, that Father has compassions on us. If we have a strong walk with God, we will have strong relationships with others. We will, because if you love the Lord your God, thank you. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, His image is recreated in you. You will naturally have a love for others you didn't have before. If you don't have strong relationships with others, you might need to go back and say, well, where's my relationship with God then? Because this is not the part of the character of God that He wants to have in my life. If you have a strong walk with God, you will develop and experience and have a strong relationship with those around you. From strong relationships come strong marriages. And by the way, young people, I encourage you, have a great friendship before you enter into marriage or even older people. It's not just young people that get married, is it? Have a strong relationship before you enter into marriage. And that can be determined on, on many different factors. You know, we have Valentine's Day coming up. You want to have a strong relationship? Don't forget about Valentine's Day. <laughs> From strong relationships come strong marriages, and from strong marriages come strong families. And from strong families, the church gains strength. And as the church has strength, the community has strength. And from the community, the entire culture is impacted. But the centrality of this, the, the connecting tissue between the individual and the community and the culture is your family, your family. We can't always go directly just from our strong walk with God and say, now I'm going to change the culture and I'm not going to care about my relationships or my family. It has to go through the way in which God is intended. Um, you know, when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, I uh, wanted to become more familiar with the writings of Ellen White, and one of the books I picked up was Adventist Home. Whew, it's tough. <laughs> it's a compilation, and I learned early how compilations can, can be both for the good and bad. But I want to share with you some quotes. These are from Adventist Home, and I think they're quite profound. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Now, I know Mrs. White has a, 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 a way of embellishing at times, we might say. This is pretty profound. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family than a thousand sermons. And you guys, this isn't difficult. This isn't difficult. If what the sermon is, if what the presentation is, has no power to affect you and your family and your relationships, then what good is the sermon? We all understand that. I can get up here and say whatever, but if there's no changing power, if people are improved by what happens, what good is the sermon? But when families are changed, when relationships are healed, when there is a love, when there is compassion and companionship, there's power. That's where the power is, is when you allow it to change you and change those that you Love. Well, one well-ordered. There's going to be similar statements along those lines. The greatest evidence, oh, these allness statements, not a lot of evidence. The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. Now, I love evangelism. I want everyone to understand the love of Jesus Christ. I want as many as possible to be along with us on that great uh, translation to heaven. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want your loved ones to be there? We love evangelism. We love telling people what God has poured into our hearts about the truth of, of last day events and prophecy and all these things. But here, the servant of the Lord tells us, first get your family straight. If your family has love, if your family has forgiveness, if your family is strong, 
that shows the power of Christianity. Now, again, one reason why I said family has pain. And there's been pain in our family. We've experienced divorce. Some of us are praying that our children will come back to the Lord. Family is not simple. It's easier to talk about the ark. It's easier to talk about buildings and sacrifices that that accomplish a powerful and an important... Again, don't get me wrong. These are powerful and important elements of understanding the plan of God. Family's hard. Family's challenging. And when we study the life of Abraham, we don't see a perfect family. We see a family in turmoil, but God raises up that family and says, I still have the power and the grace and the ability to form within you, broken as you are, a symbol and an example of what the power of God can do in your life. I want you to know that when I read these, I know this is not easy. One well-ordered, disciplined family. This will recommend the truth. Notice this. As nothing else can, as nothing else can, Dennis, I don't know why you had to take my stuff this morning. If the family is allowing the power of God in their lives, it will be the greatest testimony to the world. Preacher, you're telling me all these stuff. Now, think of it this way. I like to, well, I don't like to. It just is it's convenient to pick on car salesmen. I don't know why. They're just the stereotypical example of, you know, someone you can't trust, I guess. I don't know. They're just always trying to sell you something. So I, if you're a car salesman, please don't take this personal. It's just, a, just an illustration. But if someone was trying to sell you a car and say, this is a great car. This is the best car your family can. If you get this car, you're going to be a happy person. I really recommend, this car is going to change your life. And you say, really? Then you must own two of them, right? You want, oh no, I didn't buy that. I got a car with different dealers. I didn't buy this car, right? You'd be like, well, everything you've just told me is, is, is a lie. You understand what I'm saying? When we come up and we, we say, you know what? Have you considered Jesus? Do you know the power of Jesus? Did you know that Jesus is able to save to the other? I want you to understand and love Jesus the way. And they say, really? So Jesus is doing that in your life? Well, I don't know, really. I got to tell you, it's just rough out there. People say, well, what are you offering? I don't understand. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that any of us have arrived, except for me. I mean, I'm perfect. and uh, Pray for my wife. That's what we're praying about. No. That's <laughs> Valentine's, hud. We'll work it out. I promise. <laughs> day by day, uh, allowing the Holy Spirit. Nothing else, for it is the living witness of its practical power upon the heart. You know, it was a family that was interrupted by sin. God's family was torn apart by sin. And He wants to work with us in this time, in this age, to heal families. Our business in this world. Okay? The three angels' message? Absolutely. Do we have a mission? We have a mission. Do we have a message? We have a message. Do we have a command from the Lord to go out into all the world and preach the gospel? Absolutely. But our business in this world is to see what virtues we can teach our children and our families to possess. That they shall have an influence upon other families and thus we can be an educating power although we never entered the the desk, the preaching pulpit. That's an old term for the pulpit. Our business in this world, our first and foremost, before we can reach our community, before we can reach our culture, even before our church can be of greatest benefit, our spiritual walks with God, our personal relationships, our marriages, and our families should be foundations for how God wants to use us. A well-ordered, again, well-ordered, well-disciplined family in the sight of God is more precious than fine gold, even that of the golden wedge of Ophir. That's pretty good stuff. I guess Ophir was the best gold out there. (laughs) How much does God care about our family? Pretty important. 
when God introduces us to Abram or Abraham, he is not a perfect individual. As a matter of fact, the book of Joshua tells us that Abraham and his family had been pagans before God called them. He wasn't the choir boy that grew up and was perfect. He came from a very different religious world, and he had to accept the voice of God. He had to make some decisions in his life to do what God had asked for him. And in the family and individual of Abraham, God begins to establish a family. And in Genesis 18, long after this, this is when he's talking to him about interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah and for Lot. This is what God says of Abram or of Abraham. He says, for I have known him. I'm using the New King James here. Most modern translations say I've chosen him, but there's, they're both fine. But I like this more uh, literal translation of God saying, I know him. There's intimacy there. Choice is kind of arbitrary. I chose him. You know, I told him, I chose him. There's an arbitrary like uh, To say I've known him, there's a little bit more intimacy, so I chose it here. I have known him, God says. I've known him. And you want to know what? He knows me too, because Abram is one of the only individuals in the Bible that is said to be a friend of God. A friend of God. A lot of great people in the Bible. But that title, that relationship seems reserved for Abraham. Abraham was a friend of God. I have known him in order. This is what has happened because of my relationship with him. This is what has happened because of my intimacy with him. I have given him a commission that he may then translate and share that intimacy and that reality with his children and his household. I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they would keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice within his family. The commission has been found to establish on earth an agency and a vehicle of salvation within the family that the Lord may bring to Abraham that which he has spoken to him. I have known him. I have known him. Does he know you? And do you know him? He calls you his child. Do you call him your father? He calls you his friend. Is he your friend? I have known him. As we go through over the next few weeks, we're going to go deep and intimate into these stories that you probably again, have studied many times or you've known. I think, though, that there's still a worthy lesson to be found. Abraham and his family becomes God's eternal symbol of faith, redemption, and hope. In Genesis 12, we're going to look at his marriage. Perfect, right? But no, it's not. In Genesis 13, long before Isaac or Ishmael is born, we're going to see the seeds of Abraham and how he will deal with children. In Genesis 14, the expression of Abraham's investment to the world around him, similar to the church. And then I, I have to skip chapter 15 uh, because we're going to look at Abram, Sarah, and Hagar. And this is going to be right before I go to Egypt. <laughs> My wife and I get a chance in March uh, to fulfill a a dream of going to Israel and Egypt in the Middle East. Um, it's one of the only Bible lands we've not been able to go to. So right before then, I'm going to do Genesis 16, and then I'm getting out of here. Because I'm telling you, that'll be a tough one. Genesis 16. I'm letting you know this in advance. That's not going to be an easy one. And then I'll leave. <laughs> But I think it's worthy. I think God is inviting us in the days in which we live, in the moments in which we live, to seek his heart on these things. So I invite you to continue sharing and continue coming as we go through this series. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much that you have given us your word. And you have given us these symbols and metaphors. You've given us stories not just to appreciate as kind of a, 
uh, almost a fairy tale or that's so long ago, it's interesting, but what does it have to do? Lord, you have a way of helping us see the eternal message that can be of great benefit and blessing to us. Lord, we understand and we know that we are a family. But within that, we have lessons we can still learn. And there can still be mercy and grace and strength and power to show that within our family, the Savior can be found. And we want as many as possible to see the Savior and to love the Savior before your soon return. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I am looking forward to worshiping with you and doing some of the other activities this afternoon, and then we'll see you tonight for our church meeting. God bless.